We've talked a great deal, for example, about Trump's apparently deliberate decision to double and triple down on his rhetoric about immigrants poisoning the blood of our nation, the opposite of any kind of rhetoric that George W. Bush, for example, would have used. And yet, uh, a CNN, a Des Moines Register poll found that Trump's poisoning the blood comments, 42% of Iowa caucus goers say it makes them more likely to support Donald Trump. What's going on here within the Republican Party that accounts for this dramatic shift in, in, in the underlying values? Yeah, I think it's a morally deformed party. Uh, and, um, you know, Donald Trump didn't appear ex nihilo. It didn't come out of nowhere. So in 2015, 2016, he tapped into something that was problematic about the Republican Party. But when he won the nomination, certainly when he became president, all of that accelerated. And right now, the kind of things that um, would have offended most Republicans pre-Trump and offends most people who are not pro-Republican these days actually makes him stronger. It's almost like a kind of evil character in a Marvel uh, comic, a Marvel uh, movie, which is the worse he acts, the stronger he becomes. Um, and that is just the reality. There is a kind of psychic satisfaction, I would say, an emotional satisfaction that a lot of Republican uh, voters, base voters, get from seeing Donald Trump transgress these lines, um, say these things, do these things that are that are awful or corrupt. Uh, so this has, to me, been the, 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 the great challenge. Donald Trump, I think, is a sociopath. What he's doing is expected. The fact that he would turn virtually an entire political party into his defenders, his supporters, and the instruments of, of his maliciousness and malignancy um, is really depressing and really quite worrisome. Well, Tim, um, you know, you have spoken really powerfully from uh, the, the, the heartland of the country, but a different perspective and Democrats really needing to tap into populism without sliding over in, into Trumpism. But I, I, for all the warning signs about Donald Trump's rhetoric, poisoning the blood and other comments that seem descended from demagogues of the past, I, I was struck to see President Biden's campaign uh, go so far as to, in a post, compare ex-President Trump to Hitler. Uh, by anything resembling normal discourse, this is outside the bounds. I wonder if you think it is, it is dangerous for President Biden's campaign to draw that connection explicitly because it, it, it degrades the discourse further, which is part of their claim about defending democracy. Well, I, I mean, I'm I'm sympathetic to them wanting to do that because it's so abundantly clear what Trump is saying has been said before uh, in the history of the world and led to very dire consequences. The othering of people, uh, the separation, the vermin comment, all of that language, those words have been used before and they led to a great world catastrophe. So I understand that and I think they do need to be very clear in identifying that as are the courageous Republicans that I sit on this panel with and the others who have had the guts to stick their neck out uh, because we're worried about our democracy. At the end of the day, the campaign does have to pivot back to economic issues because when you look at all the polling, uh, it's it's you know jobs, wages, pensions, you know uh, food prices, even gas prices are coming down, but that's still a, an issue for some people, and it's got to get back to those economic issues. So I think you you draw a very clear line uh, with what Trump is saying, and by all accounts, this is going to be a Trump Biden race, in which I'll be a, a thousand percent behind Joe Biden. But I think is Trump increases the energy in the Republican primary. There's also a risk of him really alienating moderate independent voters, Republican voters. So that's a that's a big risk for him as well. You know, uh, Pete, you know, you have been such an eloquent man of faith in politics, taking uh, that that view of things. And yet I was very struck by a recent piece you wrote for The Atlantic, always excellent, where you said, quite frankly, uh, Trump's rhetoric is clearly fascistic. Um, so you must, you know, agree with on some level this critique. But I wonder if you think the current sitting president of the United States doing so via his campaign, uh, it actually declines to that defining deviancy down. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, some of Trump's rhetoric makes Mein Kampf seem like a subtle text, and that's a real problem. Um, I'm not sure that comparing him to Hitler is, is the right way to go. Um, it, 
I, I just my intuition is that's probably a little bit too far. I would really focus in on the threat that he is. There are a lot of other really pernicious figures in history to use. Hitler's always been separate and apart for, for obvious reasons and rightfully so. Um, I, I do think that it's an indication that it's uh, that the campaign is it's dawning on them, that they really have to go hard at Trump directly. They may have waited a little bit too too long and really make this a referendum on Donald Trump. And, and I agree with, with with Tim Ryan. You know, the economy is going to matter a lot. But I do mm -hmm. think that the overarching mm -hmm. issue of this is really the same one that was 2020. I think Biden understood the theory of the case in 2020, which was about the, the soul of the country. And I think there's something similar going on um, as as well. They really do have to train their guns on on, on Trump figuratively. But they have to do Thank so you. in a in a pretty sure. skilled and focused way. And it will. And we're going to discuss the economy at great length later in the show. Sarah, I, I want to end with you, because one of the things I mean, I, I think Pete did a good job of explaining how Trump uh, is, is such a, a sticky, resilient figure in, in Republican psyche uh, in the realm of grievance politics. And yet the record, the downstream record of his figures and the election results since he was first elected uh, have been pretty bad. Not only in, in the election results have we seen Democrats outperforming, but in the state of the state parties, uh, Florida State GOP in chaos right now, but Michigan GOP, great reporting from CNN that I highly recommend people read about a, a state party that is, it seems like, you know, insolvent on the bird of insolvency and it being called an incompetent dumpster fire by other leading members of the party. This is this kind of Trump contagion that seems to foreshadow failure. How is that record on the local level uh, not reflecting on the kind of people he has empowered and inspired? Yeah, as you said, a lot of the state parties in uh, key battleground states have uh, kind of been uh, very loyal to Trump and have become some of his most ardent supporters and defending him. And as a result, they've just been losing. And that has been my message to a lot of Republicans is that, why would we go with Trump who sets the tone at the top and then there's this trickle down effect with him where down ballot we continue to lose races time and time again. He hasn't won an election since 2016 and he has continued to hurt our uh, prospects as Republicans um, since then. You look at 2018, 2020, 2022. And I think that that same effect will happen in 2024, where he'll hurt Republicans down ballot. And so I think that it is time for Republicans to turn the page on him. But as we've seen from these state parties and a lot of current elected officials, it doesn't seem like that's happening despite the losing record. Despite the losing record and despite the chaos in those parties, uh, you wonder when the reckoning will really sink in. Sarah, Pete, Tim, stick around. Thank you. More great conversation ahead about the economy.